And we're recording. Right, OK, let's kick off. Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Patenka and I'm a cloud solution architect for Microsoft. Hey everybody, my name is John Lunn, aka Johnny Chips, and I'm a technical architect and I work for BT Enterprise in the UK. My name is Ahmed Lajam and I'm a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. Hi, I'm Anna McNally, I'm a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. Hi, my name is George Washira, I work for the Intellectual Property Office as a senior engineer for the Ed User Services. I'm Richard Griffiths, and I'm the Cloud Solutions Architect for Confuse.com. Hi, I'm Abel Kaya. I work as a technical payment specialist for ClearBank. And there we have it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first uh, Welsh Your User Group of 2022. Hope, uh, well, Happy New Year to everybody. Hope we've all had a a great break. I know we're, we're three weeks into the new year, so it almost feels wrong saying that now, doesn't it, somehow? But uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, if your jobs are like mine, but it's just feet haven't touched the ground since we've gone back. So um, anyhow, uh, as per usual, uh, just a quick intro from um, the guys and gals that organise the Welsh Shore Use Group. There's our details on the screen. Uh, this is, you know, at the end of the day, we're all virtual still at the moment, but it's a local community use group. We're trying to build up um, and a nice little collective of people, which we have in you guys, um, which it, it isn't a Welsh audience. It's a global audience. You know, who'd have thought, eh? So anyway, if you've got anything to say, add comments, feedback, just want to reach out, you want to speak, any of that good stuff, reach out to one of us and I'm sure we can uh, we can make that happen. So anyhow, moving on to tonight's event, um, we got another two fantastic speakers uh, lined up for you tonight. So, um, you know, really excited. There, there's certainly topics that uh, I know I'm going to get out of a lot out of personally. So really excited and looking forward to seeing them. So we've got Aidan joining us in a second to talk about um, the uh, Azure Image Builder. So looking at that. And then we've got Alpha joining us um, after Aidan's talk there to talk to us around um, Azure SQL and DevOps as well. So that'll be pretty cool. Um, there's a rough sort of um, magnitude of timing. So we'll kick off fairly soon now after this quick bit of housekeeping uh, with Aidan, um, roughly 40, 45 minute talk. Um, I'll let Aidan decide if he if he's happy with interruptions or, or chat chat channel that um, that can be discussed uh, at the start of his talk. Um, as always, we've got the quiz. So about right about quarter past eight, we'll have quiz. Uh, if you remember from last month, if you joined us last month, we've moved away from Kahoot now. So um, get ready and download a new app, which I will tell you about now if I get the link on the screen. So yeah, there's the the link there. So it's Menti, it's Mentimeter is the new quiz platform. So either down, I, I'm not sure. Is there an app, Matt? I don't know if there is an app for iOS I don't think or Android. I think it's just a website. It is all web based now, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So uh, there we are. So get on onto that website, and you, we'll give you a code after the talks a little bit later. But usual housekeeping rule, rules. Please do be courteous to each other. Um, you've all got control of your own microphones, so. Um, just be mindful to keep them on mute unless uh, you're invited to come off mute and say something. There are no silly questions. You know, clearly, you know, we're all here to learn and learn about new things. So any questions, either pop them in the chat window there and um, we'll, you know, we'll get the speaker to to acknowledge them and and, and give you some feedback on the question. Uh, or if you're invited to come off mute, you know, absolutely do that. Um, please do leave us some feedback. I'll give you a QR code at the end of the session. It would be great if you could leave us a little bit of feedback on the event. Helps us. Um, work out what um, what the community wants or what they're after. Um, yeah, and like I say, make sure that you've got that menti.com because we've got a couple of uh, £25 Amazon vouchers up for grabs on that uh, quiz as well. Um, and lastly, yeah, so be interactive, you know, get get interactive. It helps the the speakers, it helps the audience. We we're, Like I say, we're all here to learn things, so um, please, please do be engaged. Um, okay, just a couple of words from our sponsors. Um, I know we've got Des on the line so I Des I don't know if you want to say hello and say a few words yeah I'll keep this sweet and interesting thing John's didn't get kicked off so hi everyone for anybody who doesn't know me my name is Des McGuire I'm the founder and also the Azure Solution Director at Servant long-standing sponsor for the user group and we are more than happy to continue sponsoring we love um, you know providing support to to John and team I think they've done a fantastic job and they look forward to continuing this year so an interesting time I'll hand back to you John and let's say uh, crack on 
No, I appreciate that. Thanks, Des. And, and we're fortunate of not to just have the support of um, the fantastic servant and uh, Des and his guys up, uh, up in Scotland, but being a local Welsh company as well, we're headquartered in Cardiff. Um, we're, we're proud to have Admiral backing us. Um, and of course, uh, we've got NetApp as well, giving us some uh, backing there from our sponsorship. So huge thanks uh, to, to those companies for supporting our community use group. It makes it happen for us. So anyhow, I think we'll make a start. Um, Aidan, if all is good with you, can we hand straight over to, to you to take the floor, if that's all right? Yep, that is good. Uh, I'll just share my screen. There we go. Cool. Okay. Um, and slip you over there. So we'll stick on the slide deck. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, hope everyone's doing great. Um, so as you can tell by my accent, I am not from Wales. I'm uh, across the Irish Sea over in Ireland. Um, I am Aidan Finn, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, Azure Image Builder and give you a bit of an introduction around it and. By way of getting there, we'll have a look at another piece of technology, which is actually in um, Azure Image Builder called Packer. Um, so I love it when my mouse misbehaves. Uh, I am a Microsoft uh, Most Valuable Professional or MVP. Uh, my current expertise is Microsoft Azure. Uh, before that, uh, it was Hyper-V and System Center Configuration Manager. So as you can tell, I've, I've bounced around a bit in the IT industry over the years, uh, done a lot of relearning and evolved my career or digitally transformed my career over recent years. Um, I own my own company. Uh, I'm not on, on where I'm an owner of a company called Cloud Mechanics, um, where I have produced and delivered my own uh, custom written Azure training, focusing very much on real world stuff rather than on certifications. And uh, I work for a Nor Norwegian branch of a Nordic company called InnoFactor. Um, so, one of the great things about the cloud, as you can see in this event, is your location isn't always important. Uh, so I work uh, as a principal consultant on Azure infrastructure, focusing on things like uh, connectivity, security, governance, um, all the fun plumbing stuff to make all the other stuff uh, better. Um, you can find me blogging on aidenfin.com and if you want to learn about my employer uh, that's innofactor.com and of course my own company at cloudmechanics.com and if you want to see all my rants and raves and sometimes some azure stuff uh, you can find me on at joe underscore la on twitter right first thing is first vms are dead um uh, mo a recent engagement i did with a government customer in norway they told me that they would never use vms in the cloud they were done with vms and as a person who's been working with Azure for quite a few years and um, has dealt with a lot of platform first customers over the years, um, I nodded and smiled and said, we'll see. Um, VMs are not dead, uh, far from it. Uh, if you look at you know where a lot of my clients want to be, things like Azure Kubernetes service, what powers it? VMs. Um, big talking point in the last couple of years in the cloud, particularly with the pandemic, Azure Virtual Desktop. What is it? It's VMs. And you have lots of legacy workloads out there that people are moving to the cloud and no, and rarely are they actually transforming them to platform services because they're usually purchased in from an outside vendor and the outside vendor uh, can barely spell cloud, let alone migrate their workloads to operate in the cloud. So those things are running as VMs. And the VM is here and I don't see it going away anytime soon. Of course, if you peek under the covers inside the cloud, everything is VMs anyway, even serverless computing. Um, so we have all these VMs. Why are we talking about image building? Well, it's all about automation and, and saving time. It's basically extending the concept of infrastructure as code to inside the resource. And in this case, the resource is a virtual machine. And we're trying to customize it to get exactly what we want inside that virtual machine. So a couple of scenarios here. I've already mentioned, so AKS or Azure Kubernetes service. Yeah, we can use that stock Ubuntu virtual machine with the latest OS build from the Azure marketplace. But what if your developers need some piece of code that's not in that stock Ubuntu VM? How are you gonna deploy that? And then deploy a thousand of them quickly. Um, because you can have your scale set up to a thousand if your subnets are big enough. Um, well, 
the DevOps people love AKS because they're able to live in this dev in this DevOps or GitHub action or pipeline uh, life. But if they're building a new VM to host their containers, uh, who's going to sit there going next, next, next? They want to push that into a pipeline, and that's where image building comes in useful. Um, Azure Virtual Desktop. Well, the stock Windows machine is never going to be enough unless all you're ever going to use is uh, Office 365. Realistically, you're going to be putting in the, the line of business applications to power your business or your customer's business and the other bits and bobs that you typically use with Office. How are you going to get those in there? Are you going to intune those onto a 100 or a 10,000 machines? Probably not. You, you need that machine when it's built to be ready for the user. And if you're being really clever about how you're doing your your patching and your software deployment, you're doing that as an automated process, maybe once or twice a month. And of course, those legacy workloads, wouldn't we like to take them and turn them into an IAC type thing? And if you've got a silent installation, if you can script around getting that software into the machine and configure that machine, yeah, you can do that. Or at least you can get the baseline machine up and running uh, with your various bits and bobs and your run times and all that good stuff very quick, qu very quickly and very reliably and create updated versions of that image on a regular basis. And that sort of concept uh, led to the birth of a free piece of software from HashiCorp called Packer. You may know HashiCorp as the people behind Terraform, but they do other things as well. Um, and Packer is one of these very cool tools. As I said, completely free, it's a command line tool, uh, very, very simple to use, and I'm going to show you it uh, in a few minutes. Um, we basically can take uh, a, a image definition that's written either in uh, JavaScript object notation or HCL2, uh, that's HashiCorp configuration language, and that template file, we can feed it to the Packer tool, and Packer will execute a deployment for us. So it will deploy a virtual machine up in the cloud, configure it using that template file, and then capture an image from that machine using the all using the instructions that are in that template file. So basically it's a command line thing. So it's a sort of thing where we could say, you know what, I'm gonna take that template file. Maybe I keep it on my PC because maybe that's how I work. Maybe I'm, a, maybe I'm a click ops person or maybe I'm a DevOps person and I'm gonna put that up into a repo somewhere. And then I'm going to execute uh, a YAML file or pipeline or an action that will execute the packer.exe uh, from a custom container, maybe, or a custom VM, and execute my template file so I get a complete end to end uh, infrastructure as code deployment. So if you want to learn how to do Packer in Azure, um, I found the best place to get started was actually on Microsoft's site, not on the HashiCorp site. The HashiCorp documentation is fantastic. Um, and I found that across their different technologies. But there's a very simple get started with Packer in the Azure world on that page there. Um, and I'll share the slides with the user group later so you'll be able to uh, get the slides yourselves and see all the links because I know it, you can really copy down the links very easy. And in the end, you get an image that you can deploy. Um, which is the cool thing about this. Um, so you've got this reproducible thing that you can use to deploy lots of stuff. So Packer itself, there's really nothing to it. There's an executable called Packer.exe. Um, so there's not really a whole lot to show you with the, the tool. So what it actually does is it deploys uh, an image for you and that's it. So when you get uh, your Packer file and um, or when you build that Packer file and you'll find samples from Microsoft, you'll find, uh, in fact, the instructions from Microsoft that I just linked to will download a Packer file for you. Um, you or you can use the samples on the HashiCorp site. It will define a, uh, a credential that you will use to authenticate your against your Azure subscription uh, slash your resource group, depending on how you want to do your role-based access control. Uh, so that's an Azure AD app registration that has ideally contributor rights um, over this uh, scope that you've selected. That will, when you execute the Packer file against the template file, it's gonna deploy a virtual machine using a specification that's in your template file. 
by default, that will be a virtual machine that is on a dedicated virtual network that's not peered, not connected to anything. The virtual machine will have a public IP address and Parker will talk to that virtual machine over the internet using that public IP address. Uh, so Windows, it'll do WinRM. If it's uh, Ubuntu, sorry, I am not showing you the screen. If it's Ubuntu, it will do SSH. And in the end, you will end up with this Packer image file at the very end. Um, the Packer outputs are very uh, useful. So if there is a problem, um, you'll see it in your console, whether you're running it from command line, you'll see it in your your Windows terminal, your CMD, or whatever you're using. Um, if you're doing it from DevOps, you'll see it from the output window in DevOps. And there's really nothing to it, and it's not really the focus of what I want to show you today. Um, so let me just drop that back there. Um, what I actually want to show you today is, and spend more time on is actually uh, Azure Image Builder. But I'm talking to you about Packer because Packer is kind of the starting point for Azure Image Builder. Um, the template itself, it will deploy that virtual machine. And then we have a, a, what Packer or HashiCorp have called provisioners. Inside there, these are typically PowerShell for Windows, Bash for Unix or Linux. And then you have custom tasks from the community so there's a great one for windows update for example and you can download these tasks put it into your packer folder and it will execute these tasks within the image and the virtual machine when it's built i mentioned it's on a, a non-connected virtual network it have a public ip address uh, it will use a key vault to store the vm password and um, that's randomly generated because the vm is destroyed at the end all you're left with is your image um, and then you can do file transfers into that virtual machine. So you have a couple of ways you can do this. You can do the slowest possible way, which is actually do file transfers using WinRM or SSH. Um, so they're slow and they're limited in size, but let's say you need to download uh, the latest copy of Office from somewhere. And that's not gonna be suitable to copy over WinRM or SSH. What you'll do in that case is create an outbound connection from the VM. So your PowerShell script or your, uh, your as, or your bash script make an outbound connection and download that file maybe it's a HTTPS connection to github maybe it's a connection to a file server on a virtual network because you can choose to connect your virtual network if you wish um within your environment maybe you've got a file server or an azure uh uh file share uh, with a private endpoint you can connect that out over smb or maybe you're making a sas connection or a token connection to blob storage in a storage account you download your binaries and you execute them in there. We'll have a look at some of those options when we start looking at Azure Image Builder. But the cool thing now is we've got this command line tool. And we can take this thing and stick it in to a pipeline or an action. And now we can start getting a complete end-to-end -end DevOps world where we do the whole thing as infrastructure as code. We're deploying our virtual machine image or creating our virtual machine image using Packer, and that's stored as an image. And now I can go build my actual virtual machine using my Terraform, my arm, my bicep, whatever it is I prefer. And I point it at that image and say, that's what I want to build. And I'll get my virtual machine up and running with the software, with the configuration that I wanted. And that's kind of cool. Um, for example, we use this approach with Citrix with a customer last year. Um, and we were constantly getting requests to build new images, like on a two or three times a week. We needed a new image, some new configuration, some new version of uh, third-party vendor software. And we had the whole thing done as DevOps pipelines. We had a bunch of these template files sitting in the repo. And when we executed the DevOps pipeline, all we had to do was select from a drop-down list the particular image we were going to deploy. And that we passed in as a parameter into the YAML file, and that executed Packer against the template file that we'd selected in the drop-down box. Uh, and 20 minutes to half an hour later, depending on what was being deployed, there was a new image with everything done. The Citrix agent and all that stuff installed and configured and the OS optimized for Citrix. All we had to do then was take that image and bring it into the Citrix uh, cloud. So that's that. Now I've talked about that. That was the third party solution for building an image. Now let's go fully native with Azure Image Builder.
which is Packer. Microsoft have taken Packer and built it into the platform. This is the very different, so for those of us who are old enough, Microsoft's very different than what it was 10, 15 years ago, where you know other people bad, Microsoft good. Now, these days, when Microsoft sees stuff out in the community and, and they realize the community likes this thing and this thing is pretty good and why waste effort trying to build an alternative, Microsoft take those things and wrap them up and try to make them better. We see this Packer, we see the Azure Kubernetes service, we see lots of different things inside of, uh, of Azure. So this is where we're taking a, a Packer and turning it into something that's native inside of Azure. So it's supported by ARM APIs, which means we can do ARM templates, by set templates, and you know, we want to do ter Terraform templates and all that good stuff, you can do this. It's fully supported by Microsoft, and there's integration into other PaaS resources. So we're taking this Packer concept, making it native with the APIs and the tools, but now also integrating it with other resources inside of Azure. And this gets really cool. We control it, we can control it with the Azure portal to some extent. Uh, we can control it with PowerShell, and of course we get full control using uh, uh, Armor Bicep templates. So what are we doing with this Azure Image Builder? Well, we're going to produce an image version because this is taking software concepts. We're producing software effectively here. Um, it's not that we're trying to produce a Windows Server or a Windows 10 or a Windows 11 image or whatever it is. We're trying to build software and we have a defined template and every once in a while there's going to be an update to that. It might just be Windows updates or Linux updates. It may be that there's a newer version of Adobe Reader or whatever it is we're putting into that image. And we produce a new version of that image. And we can deploy the latest version of that or whatever. We can distribute that around using the Azure Compute Gallery. Now, you may, that might be a new term to you, and it was to me. Um, I knew the Azure Compute Gallery as the shared image gallery, but the Azure Compute Gallery is is an, a PaaS resource that was recently expanded its responsibilities. So it's not just delivering images now, it's also delivering software that can be deployed as a package into virtual machines. So we're starting to see software deployment make its way into Azure through the Azure Compute Gallery. We can replicate that image now, or that image version across Azure regions. So let's say I have defined a, or I have built a software defined data center using Azure Kubernetes service. Now, if you're an international organization, you may have Azure Kubernetes running across multiple Azure regions. And you view that as one virtual data center that lives across the globe. You want to deliver your image to that entire environment. You need to, to get that image from maybe you're building it in UK West or UK South or whatever it is. You want to get it out to West Europe, you want to get it to East US and uh, Korea Central and all these different places where you may be running AKS. Well, the way you do that is not to do cut blobby or blob copies around the place. It's drop into the Azure Compute Gallery and say, I want this image version replicated or this image replicated out to these various different regions. And I want so many replicas in these different regions. And I'll explain that a little later on. And now when AKS is building out a new VM scale set or a new version of the VM scale set, it grabs the local copy of that image version. And of course, now we can produce our VMs for AKS, Azure Virtual Desktop or whatever it is from that image version in the Azure Compute Gallery. So let's have a quick tour of Azure Image Builder. So Azure Image Builder has a few different resources. Um, we have at the heart of everything, the Azure Compute Gallery. That Azure Compute Gallery allows me to take my image versions or my images and version them and distribute them around the different places. So you can see I've got something in here called an image definition. And this image definition is basically my branding for my image. So I can give it whatever brand I want. So you can say, right, this thing is produced by um, Aiden Finn's company, and it's going to have this name, and it's going to have this licensing, and all this other good stuff. And I'm going to distribute that to different places around the world. So you can see I have distributed this to West Europe, and I can distribute it to lots of different places. So I can update my replication and say, you know what, let's also have this in East US. Let's have one copy there. 
what sort of storage do I want? Um, well, this is going to be zone redundant storage because my workload in East US is going to be across different availability zones. And if my share, if one of those zones goes down and brings down one replica of my Azure Compute Gallery, the other two replicas will still be there and I'll still be able to deploy out virtual machines or new virtual machines. And maybe I want to go Korea Central and maybe I'm going to have lots of deployments going on there uh, simultaneously. Uh, so I'm going to add more performance. Well, I'm also going to do some zone redundant there because that's really important to me. Maybe I'm going to go South Africa and maybe I'm only going to keep one there because I'm not going to have a whole lot of simultaneous deployments and maybe I'm not using availability zones. Maybe I want to speed up my deployment for the small number of machines and I can go premium storage. So we can see how we can replicate different things out very, very quickly. Now, every time I'm updating my image, I can pick out how uh, I want to replicate it around the world. So now when I'm deploying those resources around the world or those virtual machines around the world, they can pick up this image version from the local replica. So that's the Azure Compute Gallery. The Azure Com Compute Gallery is link, has child resources. And those child resources are my image definition. So my image definition is basically my branding for my virtual machine. I am also able to do some interesting things in here. So I can say, well, right, when you deploy this, the images that are associated with this definition, maybe there should be a, a minimum of four virtual CPUs. Um, or maybe it's a maximum of whatever. So I can control it like so. I can also say, you know what, there should be a certain amount of memory in the virtual machine. So maybe I'm supporting up to 640, but maybe my virtual machine or my application requires a minimum of uh, 64 gigs of RAM. And I can also say the software has an end of life date um, that's in there. So maybe I am deliberately building images and um, that are supposed to have a short life and um, because I'm going to frequent frequently update these images or iterate through these images um, or maybe there's a licensing thing where I'm saying this software has an end of life uh, based on a contract and I need to make sure that it is no longer used after that particular date. So I have those options in the image definition and that is a child of the compute gallery. Now to the side of that, we have an image template and it links to that definition. This image template is where we do the magic. So this is where we do all the configuration. So if we have a look at the template itself, we can see a bunch of different things in here. So we can see, for example, the identity that's going to be used. So this is a, like in Packer, this is a, a an SPN or a, a, an app registration in Azure AD, and we want to have certain rights. So there's a custom role that if you follow the Microsoft documentation that will give this uh, custom or this app registration um, certain rights over the uh, compute gallery and the image uh, resource type uh, in Azure. So this identity, when it executes to deploy this template, will be able to add images into the compute gallery or create managed in images. So the, more, the older type of image that exists inside of Azure. We specify our source. So this is familiar if you've been working with virtual machines. So we can say that we want to work with Windows Server or Ubuntu or whatever it is. If I'm working with Azure Virtual Desktop, I can choose one of the, uh, the images that's produced by the M365 division. Um, it includes Microsoft 365 software and FS Logics and all that good stuff. Um, and then we get to the customized section. So this is the really cool bit, and this is where we can put in tasks. And these are typically um, one of three things. They are either PowerShell, uh, Bash, or like in Packer, custom tasks that can be brought in uh, from the community. Uh, but more often than not, we're in the Windows world when we're talking about this stuff, so we're probably looking at PowerShell. That can also be an inline script like you see here. Or it can be a script that you link, you download and link to. And you execute that script. Um, 
you can also do a hybrid of that as well, where you could do a inline script that downloads a PowerShell script from somewhere and then executes that PowerShell script from command line. And finally, we have the distribute section. And this is what do I want to do with my image once it's produced? So do I want to tag it? Um, do I want to send it to a compute gallery? And if I do, what regions do I want to select, uh, send it to? I can also say what type of image. So in this case, it's a shared image, which means it's going into what was called the shared image gallery, which is now the Azure Compute Gallery. So that could also be a managed image or it could be a VHD uh, sitting in blob storage. And of course, we have a build timeout. So if the build does actually uh, hang, we can say right after 120 minutes or whatever it is, just abandon this job. So that's the template. It's an ARM document that you produce and you import or you uh, load up into uh, Azure uh, using whatever way you want to do it. So there's a PowerShell command for doing this, but Azure Image Builder, you could also just do an ARM uh, deployment or a BICEP deployment or whatever. Mention the identity as well. And then we're ready to go, once we've got the image template and the image definition, we can go into um, a number of different places where we can actually build the image. So I can say, right, this is my image definition, and I would like to create a new version of it. So I just say, right, I'm going to add version. And great, they've changed this UI on me. Bloody hell. Um, right, I'm actually just going to go into the template. I love it when this happens with the portal. There we go. And I'm going to go start build. So we're going to let that cook and we're going to come back to it in a few minutes. Uh, so I will go back to the presentation and talk about what's uh, some uh, talk about the Azure Image Builder a little more. If you want some step by steps, um, I've linked them in here. So again, docs.microsoft.com, um, some really good documentation on how to get started with this. So there's uh, one for Windows where you just build a generic Windows machine and they have some tasks in there just to show you how you can customize that machine using PowerShell. There's also a specific one for Azure Virtual Desktop. I guess they realize that an awful lot of people who are going to use Azure Image Builder are probably aiming to build an image to deploy lots of pooled machines or shared machine or dedicated machines for Azure uh, Virtual Desktop. So the resources, we've had a quick look at them. Um, this is basically what it looks like from the ARM perspective. Um, so there's a number of different resources in play. Um, I've talked about them. Um, so we have the, the gallery itself, and we uh, have the gallery image, which is a sub-resource. That is actually the image definition, and this is the branding. So this is where I can say, right, this is an Aiden Finn image, and this is my licensing terms, and, all, and this, that, and the other. That uh, is linked to by our template, and the template is that bit, that ARM file that gives us all the customization saying this is the source machine I'd like to use from the marketplace or an existing image, um, and these are the ways I want to customize it, and that will link to the image definition. When we execute that image template, like we just did a moment ago, and we build, start a build, um, that will produce a new version, which is over here. The image template is also linked to that managed ID or that SPN, um, and that has a custom role, which is documented in the Microsoft documentation. And um, so the identity has rights to uh, the gallery itself to add images or to add managed images to the resource group if we choose to use that as a target or a destination type instead. So the compute gallery, as I mentioned, it ha if you're looking at older documentation you may see, or older blog posts, you may see it referred to as the shared image gallery. Um, and it's a uh, Microsoft compute gallery, galleries type. Um, so if you look in the, uh, the ARM reference or the BICEP reference, you'll see all the possibilities for configuring that image type up there. Primary purpose for us is to store images that we produce out of Azure Image Builder, but in preview, there is the ability to um, 
store application packages and deliver those application packages to virtual machines. So we can extend that concept of infrastructure as code into the guest OS of the virtual machine even more. As I mentioned a couple of times now, the, uh, the images that we store in that um, compute gallery um, can be replicated inside of re a region, so we can keep multiple copies of it in a region, but we can also replicate it across regions. So we can um, have the image close to where we need to build using that image. The image definition is our branding. Um, so we can give the image a name, we can specify our publisher, we can create offers or SKUs, we can define what the OS type is, we can say what VM generation um, can be built using it, we can give our end of life date, we can also specify the, the recommended VM specs as well. And the image template, this is where you're going to do all your engineering really. And this is where you're going to be doing the customization over time. So it specifies our source, whether it's marketplace, an existing image, etc. Um, that we want to update or create a new version or a new image from. Um, we can have customizations, so those PowerShell or Bash or uh, third-party community uh, extensions to take that stock image and then turn it into something else. Um, the distribution object, which is where we specify how or what we want to create. Is it a managed image? Is it a VHD? Is it something that's going to go into that compute gallery? And the resource ID of the managed identity that's used to permit the build to update our gallery um, or create those managed images. When you uh, define your image template and load it into Azure, it is going to create a staging resource group. So if we go back now, and have a look at my resource groups, you will see there is a resource group with an awful name here. We cannot control that name, unfortunately. So if you have naming standards, you're gonna to have to realize wherever you've got Azure Image Builder, you're gonna have resource groups that break your naming standard. I don't think I've seen anyone having naming standard that looks like that. And that is the standard that's used by Azure Image Builder. And you can see there is something going on here. There is a virtual machine with a network it's got a network security group, it's got an OS disk, it's got a NIC, it's got a key vault where it's storing a password, it's got a public IP address by default, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, and it's got a storage account. The storage account, if we go into containers, we can see there's a folder called Packer Logs. Hey, it's Packer in the platform. We can go into Packer Logs and we can see there's a container. If we have a look at it, we can see that it's running right now and this, if we download and open the file, this is the log that's produced by Packer right now for this build. So we can track what's going on. And if the build fails, we can actually look at the file and see what went wrong. And we can diagnose what actually happened. And if you're a bit more clever than me, you can probably automate that so you can stream it out to somewhere as it's happening. That's not something I've actually looked that. I usually just go back afterwards and have a look at it. Once you get your build process actually working, it should be pretty smooth all of the time. Okay, so that's that folder. That folder is associated with your image template, and there's an important note on that in the Microsoft documentation, which is do not delete that folder, or that resource group, sorry. Um, that resource group, if you want to delete it, you delete your image template. That image template is expecting to see that resource group. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the image template and that resource group. Um, and that's the staging resource group uh, documentation right there. Um, the managed ID, um, so we delve into the, the image template a little bit. Uh, the managed ID um, is specified by the image template. As I said before, it get it has a custom role, and the custom role is actually documented there in the slides. You can see that it grants the managed identity that's used by the image template build rights to read uh, your compute your Azure Compute Galleries um, to read the images and to write the images as well. It also has uh, the right the ability to create managed images. Um, so this is the old image that we would have created from a virtual machine when we did a capture image on it. Um, so 
we need to create a managed ID and we need to grant it this custom role in the resource group or the subscription, uh, depending on how you're scaling out uh, your actual build process. So let's delve into that image template a little bit more. Um, unfortunately, if we look at the resource type uh, of the image template, so that's Microsoft.VirtualMachine images slash image templates. And it's um, the first of the resource types that we've actually looked at that's not um, specific to Azure Image Builder itself. Um, it's not very well documented, unfortunately. In fact, if you go look at the ARM reference or the bicep reference, it's not, it's not even listed. Um, which is a bit of a pain. You will find it on the ARM SDK documentation, but that's not exactly as easy to follow if you're not a developer uh, and I'm not a developer. There is some lightweight documentation out there um, on docs.microsoft.com for this particular resource. This is the weak bit of the documentation, which is unfortunate because this is the bit of the documentation we need most because the compute gallery and the image definition doesn't, once you've got those defined, you're not really gonna change those things. It's the image template where you're going to do your engineering because that's where you're specifying the customizations that go into your virtual machine. That's where you're specifying your source. That's where you're specifying your destination. Um, and this is where you really want the better documentation. Um, by default, um, when you execute uh, 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 or when you get a, a stock or a sample uh, image template, it's not going to specify the size of virtual machine. And when you don't specify the size of virtual machine, that's going to be used for the build. This is the virtual machine that only exists for the length of the build. It's going to use those sizes. So Gen 1 is going to be a D1v2. For Gen 2, it's going to be D2S, D, D2DSv4. Um, and say that way when you've had too many drinks. Um, the machine can be customized. Those are probably fine for most people, but if you've got certain software that requires higher, require, uh, higher resources like memory or disk, um, or you've got uh, certain hardware dependencies like you need or DMA or whatever it is, you'll want to be able to override those uh, virtual machine SKUs. You can also customize the spec a certain amount. So you can say, okay, I want to change the VM size. So the SKU stuff we just talked about. Um, you can change the OS disk size. Maybe you need a bigger OS disk or maybe you want a smaller OS disk. Um, the user assigned identities for the VM, you can also change the VNet configuration. So out of the box, it's that virtual network that's completely disconnected. The virtual machine's got a public IP address. And Azure Image Builder is talking to that virtual machine using WinRM or uh, SSH. Maybe we need the virtual machine to be on a private virtual network because maybe the software we want to put onto that is proprietary or maybe just some strict licensing. You know, you don't want to take, you know, Microsoft Office, for example, and put it on a public web page so your VM can download it. Maybe you're going to put that on Azure File Share. Or maybe you're going to put it into Blob Storage with a private endpoint. Or maybe you have a file server somewhere sitting as a VM that stores all this stuff. And you want your VM to your build VM that you're uh, using to build your image, you want it to communicate across a private network to talk to that share or the uh, whatever it is um, to download the software. So you can use that VNet config feature to specify a specific subnet that your virtual machine should uh, connect to. So a subnet that already exists in an existing virtual network. When you do that, a few things are going to happen. So your virtual machine is not going to deploy with a, a public IP address because it's no longer required. And Azure Image Builder is going to change how it communicates with that virtual machine. So it's going to use a few technologies in the platform. So it's going to use, uh, deploy a proxy VM. So when you get a build VM, you're going to get a second VM, a proxy VM. That proxy VM is going to have an Azure load balancer. So a standard tier load balancer. And when you have a standard tier load balancer, if you know your Azure networking, you know you can start doing private link. So now Azure Image Builder is able to communicate with um, that prox with your build machine through the proxy VM via private link. And so there's some clever stuff being daisy chained together to allow that control plane to get into your build virtual machine. Important bit here is the virtual network must be in the same region as the Azure Image Builder resources. So if you deploy your AIV resources into UK South, the virtual network that your build VM is going to connect to must be in UK South as well. 
now if you've got regional things you can always do um cross uh, region peering uh, or multi-region peering between virtual networks if necessary um so that's that the identity we've talked about that um already um there's a link to the documentation for that uh, at the bottom of that slide the source so out of the box the source um as you would have seen in my slides earlier um it's it's normally a marketplace image and you'll find this a whole wide variety of marketplace images in there that are produced by microsoft and um, the the useful one of course if you're doing azure virtual desktop is the image that includes uh, office 365 and fs logics and some optimizations for fs logics to make it work well um but we can also take a managed image that may already exist or we might take an image from the compute gallery so this is where you could start getting really clever so maybe you have a standard build for uh windows 10 enterprise or or windows 10 enterprise multi-user or whatever it's called today um you have a standard build for windows server and you have certain software you put in there um, so maybe there's a security solution or maybe just a management solution that you drop into every machine, no matter what. And you might have a build process for that and you put that image into your compute gallery. But then you're saying, right, I also want to build a certain Azure Virtual Desktop uh, virtual machine for this application silo and another one for a different application silo and another one for a different application silo. So you can start daisy chaining your images using this approach. So I could build my standard build for all Windows Server or all Windows 10s. Uh, and store it in the, the compute gallery. And then I could have my customized images for, for particular silos built from that standard uh, image or image version. Um, the customized section. So this is where we do the magic, as I or said before, in the image template. And this is where we modify that stock image that we're taking from the source. So. Each customization is listed in order of execution. If one customization fails, the, the whole process just stops. You'll see it in your log afterwards. And then you go back and try to fix whatever that may be. And usually it's going to be some daft thing, uh, like you don't ha um, trust executables from file shares or whatever by default. Uh, so you're downloading an exe from an Azure file share and Windows just goes, no, I don't trust that exe and it tries to pop up a box and nobody's there to actually click OK or, you know, enable UAC or whatever it is to make that executable install. Um, and then the whole thing just times out or fails. Um, and that's the sort of thing you're typically going to file, uh, be troubleshooting in your customizations. In Linux, you're going to be doing shell. So if you're doing your AKS or whatever, you're going to typically be dealing with Linux virtual machines. So you can do inline or downloaded uh, shell scripts. In Windows, again, you can do inline or downloaded scripts uh, using PowerShell. And then there's special actions. So these are typically third party uh, actions that are available to you in Azure Image Builder. So maybe it's downloading files from GitHub or Azure Storage, useful. Um, if you have software that you just want to um, store somewhere and then download into your virtual machine, uh, maybe it's a Windows restart. And uh, now there isn't one of those for Linux. Um, so if you want that, you're going to have to script that sort of thing yourself. Um, but there is a Windows restart task and you can set timeouts on that as well. There's a Windows update task and um, that is produced from the community. And of course, if you're doing Windows, you're going to need to do a sysprep. And that's where you generalize and there is a generalized task as well um, and you'll find um, some people may actually just um, script that themselves and um, because they want to have uh, complete another control over that sort of thing so finally with the image distribution so as i said before we can produce a managed image we can produce uh, an image that goes into the Azure Compute Gallery and then configure where we want to store that image, what region, how many copies inside that region, of course, select multiple regions to replicate it automatically. Um, so we can start using that image um, a few minutes after we've created it across the entire world. And finally, we can produce a VHD and stick that into a storage account if we have some legacy um, method of deploying our virtual machines. Um, a few hacks um, which you might find useful. Um, for younger people who have never done OS deployment, um, this work will be hard, to be quite honest. 
um, all the engineering is actually in the customizations, those scripts that are going to be downloading and installing software. And for a lot of younger folks, they've never done that. Those of us who've lived through the Windows XP and Windows 7 and Windows 10 uh, deployments, a lot of the skills that we learned doing those tasks, um, they're going to be reused here. So figuring out how to do a silent installation of software. You'd be amazed how many vendors don't even know if their own software can do a silent installation. And yeah, I've been there. Fortunately, we've educated some people who wrote their own software and did, they delivered consulting to install their software. And they, they actually didn't know they had a silent installation option. Sometimes you're going to come across software that does not have a silent installation. And then you're looking at the nasty world of repackaging. Uh, and of course, that could lead to support issues because the vendor may turn around and say, well, you've changed our installation routine and we don't know what else you've uh, done. We don't know what you've included or excluded, so we can't stand over our software anymore. And that gets into interesting uh, contractual uh, debates. You might need to script around some default OS behavior. And I'll give you an example. Well, I've already explained one, but I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, you might want to script the OS generalization instead of doing a third party task. Um, and a useful tip is reboots. If you think about when you're installing software on a PC, let's say you've got a brand new PC out of your, uh, your local hardware store or from the Microsoft store or whatever it is, and you have a bunch of software you want to install on that machine and you start downloading instead of doing the chocolatey thing, you just start downloading. You install a piece of software and it says, okay, I need to reboot. Well, if what's the clever thing to do? It's to reboot. Because you don't know what will not work when you try to install the next piece of software or what might break if you don't reboot the machine because whatever locked files were there when you install the software, they may not be correctly replaced when you reboot or don't reboot. Um, so you reboot frequently during this process. Um, you do your Windows update, you do a reboot. What's a clever thing to do? Another Windows update and another reboot because you never know because um, it is Windows if you're dealing with Windows. And um, so plenty of reboots in there. Um, a useful troubleshooting thing or thing to figure out what your, your customization should be is actually take the software, build the machine yourself manually or using IAC or whatever it is, deploy it, log into the virtual machine using Azure Bastion, and start installing the software. Take your scripts and run them by hand and see what happens. See if there's dialogues that appear. If there's uh, prompts to reboot, do the reboot. Uh, a, an interesting example of that is the Citrix uh, XDA or the agent, um, where you install that thing and it needs a reboot. And then you actually have to install it a second time to complete the installation. Really interesting one that one was. That was a day or two of troubleshooting, and we actually did find uh, someone who shared a Packer file for installing uh, the Citrix agent or VDA agent. Um, and uh, there was a bug in the, the file because it was pretty old, um, but we figured out the logic, which was um, install it, reboot, and then start the install installation again and then the software actually uh, completed the installation correctly and um, so it's only by installing the software by hand that you actually find these hacks um, um don't just trust the the packer process from end to finish do the, the the actual build by hand find the issues and then put in the the, the actual the reboots or the hacks or whatever it is into your scripts to mimic what you've had to do by hand and one of those I mentioned earlier is the default behavior of Windows, which is it does not trust executable files that are downloaded uh, from a file share. It, it, by default, Windows just goes, that file share is an untrusted source. So I'm not going to allow you to install that exe without someone saying, allow the exe to install. But of course, you're doing an automated deployment here. So there's no one there to sit there going, yes, I am going to install that software. So what you need to do is trust that share and then allow the binary types or the executable types uh, to be executed. So there's two registry updates you need to do and you can 
Um, you can see my PowerShell script for doing that. You need to trust the actual share. And then you need to trust the executable if it is an actual executable. And um, you can see that in the second block of code. And when you do that and you execute that as your first customization, now when you download files from a share across a network or whatever it is, or in, in that particular project, it was from an Azure file share. Um, when you do that and you execute the XC, it will silently execute first time without any prompts. Um, so your, your build process won't fail. The compute gallery, um, there's a few things that are interesting about it, which you might have uh, noticed in the, the quick demo earlier. Um, this is highly available storage under the covers. Um, it's all based on blob storage, as is most of Azure and a lot of Office 365. <coughs> Excuse me. And the storage availability options are LRS, which is the default, or zone redundant storage. So if your workload that's sitting in some particular Azure region, is built across uh, availability zones, you should choose that latter option for your image version replicas. So choose ZRS. And um, so if there is a particular zone outage in that particular region and you need to do a, a deployment for whatever reason, maybe it's a, an automated process that you do at Azure Virtual Desktop every night where you just blast all the machines and rebuild them from scratch and um, mimicking the way Citrix Cloud works. If there is a zone outage, you don't want your image to be unavailable. So choose ZRS, and that way there's three replicas across three different uh, zones in that region. Um, you can replicate your images to multiple regions. Um, so it makes sense that if I'm deploying AKS in U, uh, US East, I have a replica of my image in US East. You can also, as you would have seen in my quick demo, have more than one replica in a region. So there's two ways to look at this, and this comes from the Microsoft documentation. Um, if I'm building non-VMS or non-virtual machine scale set deployments, so individual virtual machines like you would get in Azure Virtual Desktop, one replica is good for up to 20 simultaneous uh, deployments. So if I was blasting my Azure Virtual Desktop pool and there was 100 machines in there, I should keep five replicas of my image to get optimal performance to build out those hundred virtual machines again. Okay, now if I'm doing a virtual machine scale set, it changes. Keep one replica per region for that virtual machine scale set. Of course, if I'm deploying 20 virtual machine scale set, that might change. Um, so that's the slide where let's go back and have a look and see if this build has actually completed. Um, so we'll go back into Azure Image Builder and we'll go into my image template and we can see, oh, it has not finished yet. Uh, it's still executing, but we can go back and we'll go in, in our uh, storage account. Oh, it's nearly done actually, because we can see there's an image there. So at this point, it is probably taking that image and it is putting it into the uh, compute gallery. So my timing wasn't that bad. I'm pretty close. Um, if we go into containers and then into packer logs and we have a look at our newest one, we can see the last update was actually 7.16 allegedly. Um, and download. And let's open the file. We can scroll down. We can see it's been doing a lot of writing. And it looks like it is done writing the logs to storage. And it is been working on that image ID or that image version ID there. So it is probably just moving the file over into the compute gallery. So there we go. There is the res a new version. You can see the version numbers. Unfortunately, we get we cannot control these names. And um, so the version number is not exactly uh, human friendly. Um, uh, we I, there's people like me who would prefer 1.0, 1. .0, 1. .0, or 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, um, or even 1.1 or something like that. Um, but we have that image version there, which is very developer friendly. And if we go into our gallery, 
can go into our definition, you can now see there is our second version. So it is completed. And now I can use this. I can create a virtual machine using my image. And you can see I can choose the latest one. And I can just basically go through the normal virtual machine dialog or wizard to build using that version. Or I can go into my version and I can say, here's another way of getting to VM. I can also have another way to get building my virtual machine scale set. And now I can build my virtual machine scale set. And of course, I can do that using ARM or BICEP or Terraform as well, where I can refer to the resource ID of my, uh, my image version. Um, so I can grab my resource ID and use that then as my source in my IAC deployment. And that is the demo it actually worked. So that's that. And that's the end of the slides. Um, so that was a quick introduction to Azure Image Builder. Um, has anyone any questions or comments um, or anything like that? I'm happy to chat. No, that was Doesn't great. Thanks, Aiden. I, I've, not, I, I've been keeping an eye on the chat. I don't think any questions have come up in the chat. And if uh, if anybody does have any questions, fire them in there now. But um, yeah, I mean, it's great to see Aiden, to be honest. That's the first in-depth look I've had personally at the Image Builder. So it's great, you know, cool to kind of take us through it. I mean, it seems to me that there's a lot of cool, powerful stuff that you can do with it in terms of, you know, building those customized images now. So yeah, really. Uh, yeah, it's a time saver. And, and you know, if you find yourself building machines over and over, it just makes sense to put some effort into it. And of course, then you can run the whole thing. Like there, there is documentation from Microsoft on how to completely automate the Azure Image Builder process from Azure DevOps. Mm -hmm. um, so you, if you're building, you know, AVD machines, because AVD is a big hot topic. Um, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Yeah. Um, legacy software is still out there. and you know, there's certainly in certain government environments, um, there's a need where the client must exist in a, a trusted network um, and they're not going to publish a web application over the internet or whatever. So you've got to kind of do that double hop through AVD or Citrix or whatever. And you're going to be building that image once, twice a month. And that's assuming there's only one silo. You're probably going to have multiple application silos. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking at, you know, people getting fans with AKS, um, it's great to be able to do that. Or just if you are working with virtual machines and everyone is, whether they think they're not or <laughs> think they are or not, everyone ends up running virtual machines. Yeah. Um, even for the most bogged standard thing, like I need a DNS server to make it easier to get to my Azure private DNS zones for private endpoint um, or whatever it is. Um, or my, my um, GitHub runners because I want to run private runners for a yeah. service environment or a private deployment of AKS. To be able to say, right, I can automate the build of that machine end to end. So yeah, I can deploy my AKS using code, but I can also make sure my GitHub runner is this code um, or for my AKS, for my app service environment or whatever it is, um, or just my stock Windows image because every organization at the end of the the or not every hour, most organizations at the end of the, the on-prem era, not that it's completely over or anything, but at the end of the mainstream on-prem era, um, we all had our standard Windows builds for server yeah. or desktop or whatever it is. You have to say, right, I can put my bits in there and I completely automate that. And maybe I have DevOps or GitHub or whatever it is, just run once a month and produce that image. So we get that same end result that Microsoft is doing with the marketplace where I just deploy latest yeah. that has everything in it. Get the latest Adobe Reader, God help us that, okay, we're updating that twice a day um, or whatever uh, into that machine and that image. So when we deploy, we're always using the latest version and we can have that compute gallery sitting there and make it an open resource to your entire organization. Say, right, here is the latest Windows or the latest Ubuntu or whatever 
tips. Um, like uh, you think about the Ubuntu or even the Java world, I think we all heard about Log4j not so long mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. We were all told to get the latest version of software, update my latest, you know, lamp stack. And um, so I have, I shut off that supply uh, vector attack. Um, yeah, not that we weren't protected by Azure a couple of days later anyway, because if the OWASP rule set was updated and <laughs> we were protected against log for j Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, there's, no, it's, it's, it's really there's cool stuff there no, where we can save operations time. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of things to take out of that talk, Aidan. I think it's uh, it's too easy to kind of sit back and think, well, okay, I'll, I'll just get the gallery image. I'll, you know, install my 365 app. Certainly if it's, you know, ABD, I'll put my web apps as shortcuts on there. <laughs> you know, I'll try not to install too yeah. many thick apps. Um, you know, but but certainly, you know, that, that, that traditional sense of building up an image, that's really cool to see, actually, especially around the automation, sticking it in a pipeline. Like you say, it just takes a lot of that heavy. Okay, there's probably a learning curve to get over with finding those commands and sticking them into Packer and getting that Packer template, I'm imagining, up to scratch. There's probably that slight little learning curve, but well, once you've got it, I guess you can start to keep these as gallery files and templates that you can, like you say, spin up at yeah. your leisure. I learned Packer in about a day and a half. Okay, yeah. And one of my buddies, uh, completely converted that into a DevOps pipeline on a Saturday, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. And um, so it's not a huge amount of work. And when we looked at the end of that project three months later, we had saved so many hours. Mm, mm. <laughs> it was just crazy because every time we produced a Citrix image and it went off the testing, there was feedback like very quickly saying, Right, we're missing this runtime, or we need that registry setting hacked um, out of the box, or whatever it was, because the 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 horrible thick client software lives on, um, and the investment in a technology like this is just worth it. Whether you go down the Packer route or you go down the Azure Image Builder route, which is very very similar. Um, really, it's on, in the the uh, template file for the image. It's there's only slight differences. It's just terminology. It's like going from GitHub to DevOps. In the end, it's the same. Sure. It's just what they call it is a little different. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, you give me so, another thing to add to the list now, Aiden. Anyway, to look at, and I'm sure everybody else on the sorry. call is, is thinking the same thing. No, it's all right. It's all right. I'll stick on the list now. Aiden, look, I I think we could chat all night to be honest, but um. Yeah, we, we'll move on to the next talk now. Huge thanks for joining us. Really do appreciate giving your time up and taking us through that. It's um, It's been really insightful. I, I've certainly got a lot of uh, good info out of that for, uh, personally, so I'm sure everybody else has. So, Aidan, thanks so much. Um, I don't know if everybody wants to click on no the, the clappy hands or come off come off mute and give Aidan a round of applause. Here we are, the virtual round of applause, and you love it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks Aiden. for having me. No, a huge thanks. We'll no doubt we'll get you back on in a few months' time. That was fantastic. Thanks, uh, thanks for for joining us, Aiden. Bye. Right. Okay. And yeah, running a little bit um, over time at the minute, but um, I think we'll just crack straight on with with Alpa. If you're there. Oh. Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Loud and clear. Yeah, I'll um, I'll just hand straight over to you. Thanks for joining us, Alpha. Yeah. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you all and welcome to my session, Azure SQL Server and DevOps for everyone. This is an introductory session, uh, so it's for everyone. And here I'm going to show uh, one technique, simple technique to deploy your Azure SQL Server and Azure SQL database using the Azure DevOps, which is very quickly and uh, you can use it uh, using the CI CD pipeline. So you save your time because you can deploy it in multiple environments at a time as well. And if you don't need it, you can delete it and you can deploy it again whenever you need it using the CI CD pipeline. So let's start with myself. I'm Alpa Budbati and I'm working as Azure consultant at Cluster Reply. 
I'm Microsoft Certified Trainer and I'm a Microsoft Certified Azure Data Engineer, Azure Data Scientist and Azure Developer. I have also provided you my LinkedIn information. So in a case you would like to join me or if you have any question, then please feel free to do that. So let's start with today's agenda. So today's agenda is divided into four main parts. In first part, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction of Azure DevOps, which is very, very quickly in a few lines. Then I'm going to show you a few tools uh, which we can use in a Dev DevOps cycle for Azure SQL Server. Then I'm going to provide you a quick introduction of a deck pick file, which is very, very quick. And then we're going to see a demo and we have we're going to see a series of demo. So let's start with uh, first topic, which is what is Azure DevOps? I'm sure you all know the definition, so I'm just uh, giving you a few information, which is very, very quick about Azure DevOps. So we can say that it simplifies the process of creating a continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline to uh, Azure. You can do automatic unit testing after just after the continuous integration and if there is any issue then you can find it and this is the automated integration or unit testing as well also you can monitor your uh, code change you can monitor your pipelines you monitor your process and many more uh, you can bring your existence code and git repository or you can select a simple sample application and once you commit and push your change to a repository it will provide automation by ci and cd and unit testing as well and you can deploy your code in a multiple different environments at a time or you can deploy it uh, single environments at a time as well uh, you can trigger your pipelines automatically or you can trigger it manually as well so if you need more information, then this is the link which help you to get more information about uh, CICD concept. So let's start with tools now. So which kind of tool we needed to implement these changes? So first of all, we need SSMS, which is Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio. Then we need Visual Studio. So this Visual Studio, you can have it in a 2016 or 17 version. Then you need to explicitly install the SSDT tool, which is SQL Server Database tool. Uh, and, but if you have a Visual Studio 2019, then you don't need to worry about it at all. Because when you install a Visual Studio 2019, there is option to install the SSDT as well. Then you can use another tool, which is Azure Data Studio. You can also use a Visual Studio code as well. But for this demo, I have used a first two, which is SSMS and Visual Studio 2019. So these are the tools which you needed to implement these uh, steps. Now let's move next to DACPIC file. So what is a DACPIC file? So DACPIC file is a data tier application component packages. It's have all in one or for example, your uh, database objects uh, like uh, table, uh, store procedure, view, sec uh, sec uh, security objects, or any object database related object is hold in uh, this package. It simplifies the development, deployment, management of your data tier elements. And this is in form of the compressed GIF file folder all in one in that compressed zip file folder and that folder holds the model of your database design which is in a XML format and also this model is contain the metadata information of your database and it, which is also in a XML format so this is a basically a DACPEC file which is a unit and it's a window based file so you can download it in your machine and you can import as well so let's start with uh, demo now so here we are going to see four different demos so let's start with first one which is a tech pick creation 
So for that, let's uh, move to uh, SSMS. So this is my SQL Server Management Studio. So here, uh, why I need this? Because I need to create a database. Either I create database or I can restore database or I can connect the Azure SQL database. So I am just creating my, this is my local database. And now I'm creating to deck pick file. So for that, I need to right click and then I need to go to task and then I need to create a, a, a deck pick file. Uh, which is extract data tier application. So here, uh, when it's uh, finalize this process, and if the process is generate a deck pick file, which have all objects which I have in my database. So let's click next. Uh, you can change your application name. Uh, you can give a description and you will decide where it supposed to save. So let's save into my this folder. And if that is already existed, then you can uh, overwrite them if you like. So let's let's click next now. So now it's generating my DigWig file into my local machine. It take a few minutes. So after that, uh, once it's doing that, let me. Oh yeah, it's done. It's finished it. So it's that's it. So now I have my this uh, database object in my local uh, machine saved in a file system, which is a deck pick file. So here you can do either create your new database or you can connect with your Azure SQL Server database or you can restore a database. You can download from your Internet uh, and restore it in here. So that way we need first of all database. Then after we can create deck pick file. And then now we are going to import that into our Visual Studio, which is um, this. So let me create a new Visual Studio uh, because I already have it. So we, I'm just going to create a new Visual Studio project um, to show you how you can create it. So it's this one. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So this is where once you connect to your Visual Studio 2019, then you can create a new project. And this project is a SQL database project. So you can search either or you can just create here. You can give a suitable name. And you can uh, point to your repository as well, local directory, and then you just create next. OK, so I have already database two is there. Let's have. A... So I'm just creating it uh, empty uh, database project in a Visual Studio 2019. Once it's ready, you can see it's it look like this way. And then now I need to import a deck pick file, which I have downloaded from my uh, SSMS database. So you can right click and you can import it. And you browse it same file, which I have saved in. Uh, I think I saved it somewhere. Uh, Let's I think I have to download it again, but basically uh, you just need to import that one. Uh, let's go to here and download it again. So we are saving it in here. So 
So we are just creating that it again because earlier I am not able to find it. However, I saved it in the same folder. So you can see here report as well. So let's finish it. And now go to that folder. So yeah, it's in here, okay. Now let's go to import it again, uh, which is, uh, yeah, this time it's here. So let's open this. So this way you just uh, importing your uh, deck pick uh, project uh, file from your S SSMS to your Visual Studio project. And here you can import security information if you like, and you can import many more things as well. So that's it. So end of this, you will see that these all objects, database, database objects will you can see it here. You can see table, store procedure, or whatever is available objects, all you can see it in here. Um, and so once you have this one, then you need to create your repository. You have to connect your uh, this project with your uh, DevOps repository. And then once you commit and post your change for in here, it will generate a CR uh, continuous integration and continuous delivery. So this is a one project. Now let me add one more project, which is, um, I think I need to create another project anyway, uh, which is we are creating another project regarding Azure ARM template, resource manager, Azure resource group project for deploying uh, Azure resources. So let's click next. Uh, um, you you can give a suitable name, but I'm just keeping as it is and um, continue. So I'm creating a Azure resource group project in a Visual Studio and by default, I just clicking blank one. So this way you need to create two, two projects. One project is for Azure SQL uh, uh, database. Uh, object need to deploy and another one is to Azure SQL Server and database itself to deploy. So this is a resource uh, project and uh, here you can see that it has a JSON format uh, which has a uh, parameters variable and resource which is Azure SQL Server, Azure SQL database um, and that firewall rule auditing rule those kind of things will be here and this is parameters. So this way you need to create your project first of all and then you need to set up your repository in Azure DevOps and then you need to commit and push your change. Then your two pipeline will work, which is a build pipeline and release pipeline. So I'm just going to close this project because I have already created projects um, in a, here. So let's go to uh, this Visual Studio. So you can see that here, similar way I have created these two projects here, which is SQL ARM templates and SQL DB template. So in ARM template, you can see that it has uh, parameters. You can have uh, parameters as many as you want, and this parameter is uh, override, override uh, based on a different environments. So this, these are the parameters for my uh, Azure SQL Data Server and Database Deployment. Uh, you can use variable which store the calculation information like concatenation or maybe something calculative things you can store in a variable. You can create variable like how you created a parameter. And then you can see the resources. So these resources are like uh, which re Azure resource you're going to deploy. So here, first of all, I'm going to deploy Azure SQL Server. And when I create an Azure SQL Server, this is a compulsory that I have to provide a Azure SQL admin. So this is admin uh, name and admin login information. And uh, once I have that created, then I'm creating two more resources. So here I'm setting the server level firewall rule. And Deliberately, I'm just applying the IP address ranges, uh, this one, but you can apply uh, if you already know. So this is a server level firewall rule. 
then i'm creating a database so this steps is going to create a database on my server and uh, here i am choosing the general purpose database which is serverless database also and i am uh, setting few parameters like auto post delay because here i want to delay i want to pause my database if i'm not using for more than a 60 minutes and there are few more properties so these are the azure resource management group project which deploy the Azure SQL Server, Azure SQL Database, and Server Level Firewall Rule. But you can add here more information, like you can add uh, auditing as well, and uh, virtual network related information as well, uh, private, private uh, virtual private network related information for your SQL Database and Server. So these are the JSON template uh, for a resource deployment, and these are the parameters. So these parameter I will use to override for an environment's purpose. So this is a one project and let's see a database project. So this is my um, I'm template project and now this is my database project. So in database project I have at the moment store procedure and I have uh, three tables, but I don't have uh, many information. So when I want to deploy this into different environment, I can deploy it into Dev, test, SIT or, how, or any environments at a time, or I can do individual as well. So first of all, I need to deploy a res Azure resources, and then I need to deploy a database, database objects. So once you have ready this one, then you, as I said earlier, you need to create your uh, repository and you need to connect here with your repository, Azure DevOps repository or GitHub repository. And then once you commit and push your change, uh, it will uh, comes here. Let's go to, to uh, Azure DevOps, which is, um, which is here. So this is Azure DevOps. And you can see that you can get a lot of information here. You can create your uh, dashboard. You can create a wiki, wiki kind of stuff as well. This is daily stand board as well. You can create work item, task, user story. And we are interested into pipelines. But before that, let me show you a branch and um, code. So this is my uh, branch under this uh, repository. And you can see these are it has two projects. One is a uh, SQL ARM template projects, and it has a um, database project, which is a SQL project. Uh, so these are the repository. And now let's go to pipeline. So here we have two pipelines. One is a build pipeline, and one is a trigger pipeline. So this is a pipeline. So let's start, cre I have already, but let's create a new pipeline. So if you are new, first time you coming here, then you need to create your pipeline for a build. So you can do it this in various different way. If you are very expert, then you can use ARM template. If you are very good in ARM template, or if you have a different techniques as well to use that. But for the new people, beginner people, we do like this way. So here we are create, we are setting few information. So we saying that, my team project is first of all source so my source is in a azure rep, uh, repository git then my team project is that uh, my repository also same and my branch branch name is that so this information you will set it and then you will create a empty job and here you can rename as well but i'm just keeping as it is at the moment so that's it and then now you can add more task in here. So you can add, there are so many tasks available here. Uh, you can use it. So some of them are from Microsoft and some of them are from a third party tool. So this way you can um, add a task as well. So let's uh, add a task like um, uh, .NET. Um, Is it you task you can automatically get it here? Uh, um, okay, for example, there is a dotnet uh, desktop is available, but 
but at the moment I'm not able to search it. Uh, but similar way, you just need to add a task here. And uh, then you need to choose few parameters. And based on that, uh, let, let's see what task name, actual name is. Uh, let's go to here again. So this is my build pipeline, which I already have created. And. Um, yeah, it's dot net. Uh, if we search with this one, it's supposed to automatically comes everything here. Uh, let's remove this one. You can uh, remove it easily by just right clicking there. And then now let's add a task. Yeah, at the moment it's not searching, but I few minutes ago I have added like that way. So you can add a task here. Uh, and then you by default you will get a lot of tasks automatically available. So you don't need to do any much works. And then you will see that here variables also automatically created for you. And you can uh, set uh, triggers if you want to do automatically uh, uh, continuous integration. Like, for example, if you change anything in your uh, project or the particular branch and you would like to apply a continuous integration, then you can just uh, turn this uh, up and here you can apply filter as well. And that's it. Then after you just need to save and queue and this way you will build your uh, build pipeline. So once your build pipeline is built, you just need to run it and then it will uh, generate a build artifacts which can be used by your release pipeline for a deploy into different environments. So let's start with, I have already created pipeline. So let's see already existence one, which is in here. So this is my build pipeline. And let me show you here. So you can see these are the tasks. So what task here we do? We first we do a build our solution. Then we copy our file from uh, uh, staging directory to default direct default to a staging directory and then from then uh, build publish artifact will drop uh, artifacts in a drop folder but you can choose a different folder as well and these all things will automatically generate so you don't need to worry about it all when you add that inbuilt template which is a dotnet desktop uh, so that way and you can you can give here different name as well. Uh, you can change here if you like to change it and even you can change your display name as well here and you can change version number as well. Uh, so this is my uh, publish artifact uh, full uh, task. This is a copy task which copy a file from um, uh, default to a staging. So uh, publish artifact can pick from there and this is just build my projects because I have two projects. So once it's built successfully, it will generate uh, artifacts and it will generate uh, two different artifacts in this drop uh, folder, one for uh, ARM templates and one for SQL project. So this is my uh, build, uh, build uh, pipeline and now let's go to release pipeline. So this is a release pipeline uh, you I have already, but you can create a new release pipeline by just a click here. And then here again, you selecting empty job. Are you giving here stage name? For example, Dave or um, according to which one you like Dave stage or uh, Dave QA UAT like that. And then here you are adding your artifacts. So this artifacts is from my build pipeline. So you choose your build artifacts and that's it. You can save which version you want, latest version or previous version, and you can change name as well and you just add it. So this way, this stage will give a build artifact to a release pipeline, release pipeline used from here. And here you can set again a continuous integration, a continuous deployment as well by just uh, enabling this. Uh, 
And you can add here more filter as well based on a branch. So once you have this one ready, then you need to add here task. So here you will add a task according to your uh, solution. So in my solution, I have a two task. One is ARM template and one is a SQL uh, project. So here again, you can search for a ARM template. So this is ARM templates. So you just add this one. So it will deploy uh, Azure resources such as Azure SQL Server and Azure SQL database. So you can give again suitable name or you can select your uh, resource group. And uh, you can see when you do first time, then uh, here one button will appear, which asks us to authorize it. So once you done this process, it will generate a service principle. And then and then you can do continuously. And then you can see here entries in your um, drop down other drop downs. Uh, so let's select this. And then you select your resource group as well. And this resource group, you have to create it before you do this release pipeline. So resource group should be there. So you select your resource group. And uh, then you select location as well based on that resource group. Uh, let's select just anything at the moment. And you can select your template. And this one, you will get it from your build. So this is my build uh, project and it put artifacts into drop folder and here you can see that I have ARM templates and SQL projects. So I'm just selecting first of all ARM templates. So this way you need to choose. Uh, then you need to select a parameter as well from same place, which is again in you know, here. And then you can override your parameters here. So this parameter, I am I'm getting it by default from my uh, parameter file, which in my Visual Studio, but I can change it here or I can create a variable and I can uh, use that variable here as well. So that is the thing. So once you do that, so that's it. So this is your ARM template, uh, which create a Azure resource in your Azure environment. So then after we need to add next task, which is uh, our second project, which is in a uh, SQL project. So we are searching for S Azure SQL database deployment. Here you can, there are many other tools also available, but we are using the tools which created by Microsoft, like Microsoft Corporation. But there are another third party tool also available, which is DB up and there are many more. So let's add this here. And similar way here also we setting few information like we selecting resource group, a subscription, and now we need to provide our uh, server name. So you provide your server name here, you provide database name according to which you like. You provide a login information and you select a deck pick file as well. You can do two different way, but we are using the deck pick file where you can use a script you can use inline script as well. And here you are selecting your deck pick file from your build artifacts and which is uh, this one. So this is a build artifacts. So this way you need to create it, then you save it. And if you need more variables, you can create variables here and then you can use in your pipeline in override as well. And that's it. So this way you are creating your release pipeline and you can add more stages as well. So I'm just going to close this because I have already created release pipeline. So let's go to release pipeline. Leave this page. So this is my release pipeline and let me show you how it looks. So you can see that this is my build artifacts, uh, which I have shown you earlier. I have also applied the continuous integration automatically. And here I have added three tasks. So this is a key vault because my login information, which is a username, admin username and password, I'm storing into key vault. And then I'm deploying my uh, Azure resource, resources such as Azure SQL Server and Azure SQL Database. And then here I'm deploying the actual database objects. So these are the three things I'm doing that. Uh, I would like to show you here a few things, which is a variables. 
So these are the variables I have created. You can easily add variables here by just clicking here. You giving suitable name and you selecting scope as well. Uh, which is here, so which scope like because day taste UAT live or pre prod or if you want for everyone same, then you can use release. So here you can see that my uh, database name is the same for all environments. So that's why I use release scope. But my SQL server are different. Its name is prefix with a environment. So here is a dev. Here is a TST. So it's a prefix according to the environment. So my server name is look like that. And here you can do more calculation as well. You can create our variables and you can concatenate your environment based on environment and scope variable as well. But this is very simple thing. So this is my variables. Uh, and you maybe notice that I don't have a variable for a login information, which is username uh, and password because that comes from key vaults. And for that, you can use two different way. You can get key vaults from uh, by linking your key vaults in here. Uh, or you can use a task which I have here. This task, which is another task, which is very simple. You just uh, click here and say key vault. So you just uh, adding this key vault task. And you just specifying few information like uh, your resource group subscription and your key vault name. And star means it you can see all secret or you can type individual secrets by comma like that way. So that way you can create it. So let me delete this. OK, and I just want to show you here in my resource group. So this is my resource group. And you can see that at the moment I have only a key vaults. I don't have any database or anything. And this key vault, I have a two secrets, which is um, you login username and password. So this one I'm using it in a two in a, my pipeline in DevOps pipeline directly. So uh, let's go to here. So after deployment, you will see that here Azure SQL Server and Azure SQL database will automatically create it for us. So let's try to deploy here. Let's uh, go to release pipeline again. So I, I would like to deploy into two different environments. But let's create release. You can select uh, all or a particular as well. Let's select all and you can add comment as well. So let's just create this one. So this way I'm going to deploy my Azure SQL Server and Azure SQL Database. So let's wait for some time. Um, so at the moment it's queued, so it's it will do in some time. Uh, You can check here log as well. And uh, you will see like step by step which step is executing. Uh, and uh, if there is a, some failure is happen, then you can uh, edit your release or you can edit your pipeline as well. And uh, you can refresh as well and you can download log as well here. Uh, so while he's doing that, um, let me uh, add a new stage. So let's be going to add here new stage in our pipeline, which is um, edit pipeline. Because at the moment I have a two stage uh, dev environment, test environment. So let me clone this. It's a very quick case. You can see that and you just rename this. It's copy old task. And now I just want to rename this, which is uh, UAT. That's it. So this is this way I can create third environment. I can create many environment as I want and it's very, very quick as well. So I just want to check that have I added a variable here or not? So I need to add one variable for um, 
because my uh, oh it is here already so let me just rename here so that one is a uat so that's it uh, let's save here uh, it's always good practice to add a comment here uh, so you can uh, trace it you can uh, view a log as well later on as well like in here history so let's go to here now so while this pipeline will finish we will run it again one more time and then you can see that it deployed here as well so meanwhile let's see here so this task uh, i have already explained you earlier this task also we have seen earlier um this way we just uh, are teaching you our templates and template parameters and we override parameter as well and here you can access your variable like this way ampersand and, and uh, in into bracket and these two comes from azure key vaults let's cancel this and this is a deployment so you can see that here these two also comes from Azure key vaults, but it's look like a normal variable like here what we have database variable and this variable I have already available here, but these two variables um, it's coming from key vaults. So now let's go to our pipeline and see it's uh, have release has done it's still doing it. Uh, it's a deploy the resource so you can see here a uh, little bit refreshing so here you will see that you will get new resource so now you have a two different new resources which which is a uh, database and a server for a dev environments and once it's finished then we can see it a database also deploy which is deploying uh, another things like a firewall rule or um, uh, other things for example tables store procedure and those kind of things so by default if i access uh, this database uh, it will fail because there is a no firewall rule added because i have uh, used a dummy one which is 000, zero so you will get this kind of error so for that you need to go to overview section and you need to apply a firewall rule so this firewall rule you can add as a server level or a database level always good to do our database level because you have a more than one database in the same database server and you don't want to allow them access then um, better to add a, a here so this is a firewall rule it's a very simple. You just need to add a add a client IP address. So this is a my client IP address. And I just need to save it. So once it's up, save is very important thing. If you forget, then uh, it won't work. So save is needed, and then you just need to come here into your database again. And now, if you see here, query editor. And now I'm just logging it. Hopefully, by this time, it has deployed as well. It, it may be deploying yet because I, I did little. Oh, yeah, it's just to finish it. So uh, while it's doing that, let me show you here. So it's deploying into dev environment and now it's deploying into test environment. So uh, let's see here. Yeah, so now you can see that this three tables which I have in my Visual Studio deck pick project as well. And this is a store procedure. So how did deck pick file works? So when you deploy your deck pick file via CI CD pipeline, uh, it it will generate a two com a comparison. It will say what is existing in your database and what's in your deck pick. It will generate a script difference between those two objects, and then it will deploy only that difference, not everything every time. If there is a no change, then it won't deploy anything. It's just deploy only the differences from your deck pick and your uh, database in your uh, environments. So now it's deploying into test environment. So anyway, that's fine. So like for example of tomorrow, I'm just uh, going to change something else in my uh, here database. 
I'm just adding new objects here. Uh, let's uh, or maybe just delete this table. I'm just to delete this table. And um, I'm modifying uh, this store table as well. This is very simple. You can do here many things. You can compare a schema comparison as well using uh, your uh, uh, this Visual Studio. You can use a schema comparison which compare uh, your schema from two different environments. Uh, day and test or you can co compare with your uh, changes in your solution and your environment as well. And this is a very, very good tool uh, behind the scene. It's using SSDT. Uh, and here, for example, I'm doing some changes here. Uh, let's remove this uh, column. And let's save it. And then uh, let's go to in here. So you can see that is highlighted it. And now I'm just going to commit a uh, git commit and uh, push. So I'm committing my changes. So these ch three changes, I'm deleted one and I modified two objects. Uh, once you delete your uh, any object or you add new object, at that time this project file will delete uh, up, um, update as well. So like uh, just uh, adding something. And here I'm going to do uh, commit all and push. So this way, what happened? My CI CD pipeline will trigger automatically as well. So my build pipeline will run and my uh, 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 release pipeline also run. And that we can see it in uh, here. Let's go to while it's still deploying into test environment. We just are going to um, uh, build pipeline. I think we have set to automatically, but it's still uh, waiting for something. It still hasn't started yet. So let's wait for some time and see, because it's queued at the moment. So once it's run, it will generate our artifacts here. You can see the two artifacts, and you will see that, yeah, it's running automatically it's running so you can see that as well and here you can see that what changes you can compare your changes as well as i said you can uh, view a history as well you can monitor as well so here you can change it for your uh, what new changes you are applying you can compare them side by side you can uh, merge them manually or it can merge automatically as well and uh, here you can see that i have uh, removed uh, one last column from here and this project uh, will remove the one table which I have deleted, which is here. So this way you, you will see this is my new change. So now it's generated and let's wait for it's finish it because it's still in progress here. Uh, so yeah, so this is my build pipeline and it will generate um, uh, release pipelines very soon will run the release pipeline as well. So this previous one is finished. So let's see here in portal and let's go to my resource group. And you will see, see earlier we have a two database, uh, one database and one server. But if I refresh it, you will see that now I have a, now I have a four entries, which is two database and two servers. So which is, this is a test, test environment. So this is a test server. And inside this server, you can see that it's the same database, which is a demo SQL DB. And that one also you can access by just adding firewall rule. So let's close that one. And now let's see what's here happens. Let's refresh. So build pipeline has finished. Uh, or not. Uh, Build pipeline has finished and it uh, published the build artifacts as well. So you can see it in here. And uh, you can see there are two different projects. So, so here it has a build uh, artifacts generated. And uh, you can see how much, what kind of changes is there. And you can see which branch as well. So now it's 
supposed to run a release pipeline uh, which is in progress but i think it's using the this pipeline so let's see yeah this is uh, anyway it's i i think i have connected to wrong repository so anyway this is not important so let's uh, stop this one i think we you can cancel it like this way uh, and uh, let's go back to here i, I suppose to use a uh, different uh, build so anyway so you can see it here i have now new environments here so let's create new release manually uh, so this way it will deploy into three different environments uh, even in uat as well very soon and it can do parallelly as well and it can do uh, one by one as well so this way it will deploy a uh, azure sql database and azure um, Serv server and database and uh, you can if you have unit testing then it can uh, uh, do a unit testing after the build as well so it may take some time uh, so let's see i think it's a little bit quick as well so okay so while this is doing let's uh, go back to our uh, presentation and we just seeing what left here so we have seen these uh, four demos and let me conclude it before we see the result because it takes some time to release so initially we have seen how we can use deckpick file from ssms so we have downloaded as a deckpick file from ssms and then we have imported that ssms uh, sorry deckpick file using the visual studio solution and we have created project there and then we have commit and push our change in a repository a devops repository and then we have seen that how you can build your uh, ci pipeline and how how you can build your release pipeline and you can set is automatically as well and then we at the moment we are doing this then we are deploying them into three different environments and uh, we have used azure key vaults for uh, storing the login information and for your azure and we access the key vault in your Azure um, CA CD pipeline. So now let's go back and see how it's doing this. Uh, yeah, it, it will take some time because it's just a date for Dave, but you just assuming that it will do same thing for uh, Dave test in SIT. And once it's finished this thing, or uh, you will see here, uh, Let's go to bake our resource group. You will see that here are uh, six different entry will generate. Because two or three database and three uh, uh, servers, database servers. So it will generate here. And uh, I have used the same resource group, but you can have use a different resource group as well. Then it, each resource group have a uh, two, two entries, one for a database server and one for database. So this way you can uh, deploy your uh, 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 resources. I think one is finished. It's doing to next one. Uh, you can deploy your Azure SQL Server, Azure SQL Database. You can deploy your firewall rule, and you can deploy auditings as well. And you can do some uh, private uh, Vnet uh, related information also. You can deploy as well. So let's go back and see what left. So with that, I would like to thank you for attending this session. And I would like to thank you, Wells uh, Azure Resource uh, User Groups, and uh, John as well. Uh, and with that, I'm now open with Q and A. And I have also resource group, also resource information, also here. Uh, if you like to go through that, and if you like to know the Visual Studio projects, then I can load into GitHub as well, so you can do a practice if you like to do. So let's go back and uh, wait for a Q and A. No, that was brilliant. Thanks so much, Alpha. Yep, got a lot out of that. Um, I think we do have a few questions, actually. I think there's a little bit of a conversation going on. So yeah. um, I don't know if you want to come off mute. I know, I don't know who RS is, RS or Griff. One of you wants to come off mute and have a quick Q&A. Hi there, RS yeah. here. Yeah, hi. Yeah, I was uh, just thinking how to, so we've got this um, sort of challenge with a central database. Mm -hmm. and um several microservices well several services i should say being yep. built that are mm -hmm. 
calling that central database. Mm-hmm. But we want to allow the database developers and the service developers to work independently. Mm-hmm. They can deploy their changes without breaking each other. Yep. Um, but I don't know of a nice way of doing that in yeah. in DATMAC. You know, um, you know, just just some kind of guardrails that we might be able to provide in in the DATMAC approach that can allow people to uh, the database developers to keep deploying their changes, adding columns and things, but without breaking the um, you know the uh, the service developers. Yeah. So I think it's like uh, if they're both using the same database. Is it they're both using same database? Yeah, there's there's one, one, one centralized database. database. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say with, with the addition of columns, obviously that, that wouldn't be breaking, so they could just be done, couldn't they, in advance? That's they are fine. I'm, I'm trying to get to the root of the breaking change because a breaking change to a microservice, you can't if something's calling it, it's you know it's going to break. <laughs> Um, not what you can do. I mean, if you want to do versions for the different services, you could potentially do separation with schemas, but then you've got potentially re repeated logic across things that you'd get out of sync quite quickly. Um, okay, yeah, separated schemas. Yeah, I, I guess that's one approach. But yeah, as you say, it's got its own downsides. Um, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, like I said, been in and in a very similar situation <laughs> That's kind of it. Um, because at the end of the day I and mean, the, the, the things that you're saying are the reasons why you don't want to end up like that it, it does it does become very very difficult to coordinate and um, we've just had to do it by you know coordinating quite early releases where the db team has to do it and then yeah just has to do their change and all that kind of stuff and it's you know very very difficult so eventually the pain becomes too much that you realize it's just wrong <laughs> and then you mm. have to kind of thing um, but that was obviously very 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 difficult yeah I, I totally agree with you if we communicate and collaborate with each other then maybe we get less issue yep yeah okay yep. yeah yeah thank yeah you. one thing i was going to say so with the renaming of things we had a problem with that for a while um do you use the refactor log uh no so I don't know if you've had the, the issue, like when you rename a column, it thinks that you've added and removed an old one. Yeah, I don't know if you've got that and, it's, and it becomes mm. a and recreate. Mm. So there's, if you, in, in the GUI itself, if you, it's a really weird, if you do it in code, it will drop and recreate the column in its position. It'll, it'll drop it where it is and add it to the end when you rename it. Mm. But if you actually go in the GUI in Visual Studio and rename it, it will create a re 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 blah, blah, refactor log and do an SP rename on the correct column. So it doesn't act like it's, dropping and recreating it. So refactor log is a bit of a funny one that everyone should know about, but it's not that obvious because if you do it in code and type it yourself, it doesn't do it. But if you actually refactor it in the GUI, it will create a log for you and almost do like almost a post deploy script to do the rename instead. So yeah, Google refactor log is Google DBs and that's good for renaming. Okay, thank you. Cool. Any more questions there, Griff? Are you good? Um, I don't matter the call. I could talk about this for, for days. I lived it for like two years, so yeah, I, I won't. But if you've got any questions, answer the LinkedIn or Meetup or whatever. Fire them over. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I think I've used every tool. I use like Ready Raw migration, the post deployment scripts. We had SQL agent jobs being deployed with PowerShell by the end. So anything SQL Server, I didn't. I, I don't like manual releases. I'm a scaredy cat, so I literally automated it all. <laughs> so seriously, I know to reach out. Give us a shout. Good talk as well. Really good talk, by the way. Mm. Brilliant. No, okie dokie. No, Alpa, thanks so much for that talk. Yeah, really informative. Thanks for uh, giving up your time and joining us tonight. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, John. No, if everybody wants to show your appreciation, thank you very much, Alpa, and we'll catch you soon, no doubt. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Okay, well, you don't, nobody needs to go anywhere because it's the, uh, it's the ending of the, uh, the Welsh Shore User Group's January event with our customary quiz, eh, Matt? Yep, let me just fire it up. So you're going to want to go to menti.com and you're going to want to uh, enter the code at the top. Is there? Everyone see that screen? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we got it. We've got a load of questions based on the topics you've seen tonight. And a bit of silliness in there as well as normal. So I'd expect nothing different.
see what we've got. How many we got coming in? There's a few people coming in. Excellent. So what we've got two twenty-five pound Amazon vouchers for first and second place again. Yeah, I think that's a good good place to be. Seem to be doing that one. Cool. Good number, 12. Uh, can we get one or two more? Maybe. Is anyone struggling to get in? You can put a message in the chat if you're stuck or come off mute and say. 15. Okay, we're going to kick off. I think so. There we go. Let's go for it then. Yeah. First question. Easy one. 2022 is the year of the what? If you've been past a Lego store recently, you'll know this question because they've got it plastered all over the window. <laughs> it's the year of the tiger. Well done to the nine of you who got that one right. <laughs> Question two. What's the name of the HashiCorp tool that Image Builder uses? Is it Picker, Licker, Flicker or Packer? <laughs> Right answer is Packer. Well done. Some people were paying attention. <laughs> Question three. Azure Image Builder can only build Windows VM images. Is that true or false? That's false. Question four, rattling through them tonight. Great. What's the new name for the shared image gallery? Azure Compute Gallery, Azure Image Sync, Azure VM Bucket, Azure Stuff Registry. I'm impressed, Matt. These are very topical questions. I know. Anyone would think I did my research on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Well done. And also, I got very lucky at guessing what was going to be talked about. <laughs> which, this is a complicated one now, which region is Azure Image Builder not available in? Oh, God. So this is going to be a guess for most people because I don't think it was mentioned tonight. UK South, East US, Canada Central, Australia East. Canada Central is the right answer there. According to the official docs, split the audience. <laughs> Question six. What's the name of the Azure feature that needs to be registered for Azure Image Builder to work? Azure Image Gallery, Microsoft VM Builder, Microsoft Virtual Machine Images, which tells you a lot about our naming convention. I'll give that hint away. It's Microsoft Virtual Machine Images. We pick the longest possible collection of words possible to name to enable a feature. <laughs> and our leadership, a leaderboard at the halfway point. Chris K in the lead with Chris F in second place. John in third. Chris W in fourth. Oof. And it's all very close at the top. Now we're on to some SQL DevOps questions. And Alpa, you'll have to apologise for these in case I've got any of these wrong. <laughs> no pressure when the presenter is there. <laughs> what does SM SSMS stand for? Is it SQL Server Management Studio, pseudo semi-metallic sync, server-side MetaSQL? Yes, easy one. Next up, question eight. 
What's the name of the SQL data package format? Is it Rat Pack, DAC Pack, Sat Crack, Hacky Sack? <laughs> 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 yes everyone was paying attention on that one good <laughs> i had fun writing those questions <laughs> nine what format is used for the data models in dac pack files json yaml xml or binary was everyone paying attention because i know that was mentioned XML. Oh, a few people weren't listening. We know who you are. <laughs> Question 10. Which of the following is not the name of CI CD runner? DevOps pipelines, GitHub Actions, Octopus Deploy, Bitbucket Conveyors. more hesitancy today on this one it's bit bucket conveyors yes i made that one up question 11 nearly there how much did microsoft acquire blizzard for this week 76.8 billion, 12.4 billion, 68.7 billion, or 2,000 V-Bucks? <laughs> How much is a V-Buck worth? Oh, it's about a billion these days. 68.7 billion is the right answer. So basically, it's about 12 times what Disney played for Star Wars. <laughs> Question 12, bit of a silly one, this one. Does an in-person WAG meeting with beer and pizza count as a party or a business meeting? <laughs> oh, very topical. Of course, there's no yes. wrong answer there, it's both. <laughs> <laughs> So let's see what that's left our leaderboard at. Is it all change? Uh, it's looking like there's been some reshuffling. We've got Chris K in the lead. Chris F looks like second place and Ross in third. So Chris Kowalowski, I guess that's you. Chris F, Chris Vision. If you want to... Um, yeah, I know. I, I I think I've had both your emails in the past, but do me a favour, just DM me them on LinkedIn, your email addresses, and I'll get the uh, the Amazon vouchers over to you ASAP. And thank you, everyone, for playing. Right. Thanks, Matt. OK, I'll just wrap it up then. Let me uh, share my screen so everybody can see that. So, yeah, brings me, uh, well, last thing to say really is thanks uh, to both our speakers tonight, both Aidan and Alper. Huge thanks for your fantastic talks and giving up your time to come and educate us on these parts of Azure that we may not have looked at uh, ourselves, which is fantastic. Huge thanks, most appreciated. Thanks to everybody for joining as well. Um, you know, obviously we can't, um, it's difficult to do these sessions when we've not got an audience. So really appreciate everybody joining in and sticking around and watching the sessions and being supportive. It really is appreciated. Um, okay, so moving on to next month's sessions, we've got uh, Heiko joining us and we've got Marcel joining us in February. So put that date in your diary, 16th of February. The RSVP is there for you to click on now. If you want to go and do that now and then forget to join in a month's time, that'll be fine. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody for joining. If you can leave us some feedback, uh, scan that QR code or go to that URL. Um, like I say, mark the date in the diary. Thanks everybody so much for joining. It's been great to see you. Um, anything to add, Matt? No, thank you very much, everyone. It's been a lot of fun. And thank you to both our speakers. It's been, uh, yeah, great content. Yeah, thank you. Right, we'll leave it there. But thanks, everybody, for joining and see you all soon, no doubt. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very Bye. much. Cheers, guys. Cheers, all. Bye-bye.